Hi everyone, we are now live on YouTube. I will just start the recording and until Geshema will join us, I will start uh, to say some words. Uh, I just record to the cloud first. Hi, uh, I will start in, uh, in Hebrew and then I will say the things in English and uh, Maybe Lior or Lawadio can uh, complete uh, what I will say. So first in Hebrew, אני אתחיל ברוכים הבאים, ברוכים הנמצאים. אנחנו נמצאים בימים שהם לא קלים, עוברים על כולנו, כולנו בשל המצב בארץ. אלה ימים עם חרדה שמעוררים קושי, כאב, עצב, חשש והמון תהיות לגבי מה הולך להיות. אלה ימים שבהחלט בהחלט לא קל להישאר לבד, אני חושבת שבורכנו אה, בסנגה נפלאה פה בידידי הדרמה אה, ויש בידידי הדרמה אה, תרגולים אה, ולימוד לזמנים המאתגרים האלה אה, כל, ש... כל השבוע, כל שבוע כרגע עד להודעה חדשה אה, יש לנו קריאה יומית של סוטרה טהור עם אני לו סנגה נפלאה יש לנו תרגול טר ירוקה מדי ערב, יש לנו תרגולי טר הלבנה, יש לנו מרכזי תמיכה, ניתן לראות באתר שלנו את כל הכישורים. אנחנו נפגשים כל יום שני על בודיצ'יטה עם גשי קסם גואנגמו, יש לנו מפגשי תמיכה בזום בימי ראשון, שלישי וחמישי בשעה חמש כל שבוע. בימי שישי אנחנו ממשיכים את התרגול הרוחני של דרך הבוטיסטאווה עם הנזיר קרצ'ון, זה בשעה שתיים, כל יום ראשון, כל יום שלישי, כל יום חמישי בשעה שבע בבוקר, יש לנו מדיטציה, זה גם דרך להיות עם הסנגה ולהיעזר ולהתמך אחד בשני, עם הנזירה גשי קלסן גואנגמו, ידידי הדר, החליטו שמשנים קצת את הנושא של ה... שיעור בשל המצב ובעצם אנחנו נתמקד בבודיצ'יטה אז שיעורים עצמם מתבסס, סליחה, שיעורים עצמם הולכים להתבסס על הטקסט של שבע נקודות לאימון התודעה של גשת שקאווה אם אני אומרת אותו נכון והתמקדו יותר בפן המעשי של הפיתוח של תודעת הערה ועם התרגולים של המדיטציה בשיעור הקודם גשימה גם נתנה זמן לשאול שאלות היא תעשה את זה גם הפעם אני מבקשת שמי שרוצה לשאול שאלות פשוט יש את הדרך הזאת להרים ידיים או פשוט לכתוב בצ'אט ואנחנו נדאג שכמה שיותר יוכלו לדבר ולשאול את השאלות או להביע את מה שהם מרגישים. אני מאוד 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 מבקשת להתחשב במורה שלנו ולהשאיר את המצלמות פתוחות. השיעור הוא מוקלט והוא יעלה ליוטיוב ככה שאפשר גם להסתכל עליו ולראות אותו אחר כך. תשי דילק, אבריואן. Um, following the hard situation in Israel as part of the weekly class with Geshe Kess and Gwangmo, uh, Geshema started teaching uh, Bodhichitta. The, te- the teaching is based on seven points mind training by Geshe Chakwa. I bet I'm going to say that again. Sorry about my English. Hi, Geshema. No, it's okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Dali. <laughs> um, the situation in Israel It's so hard, it's so difficult, um, with a lot of fear, a lot of thoughts uh, um, that you don't know what is going on and what will be. Um, so it's not an easy life now like it used to be. Mm-hmm. And there is a lot of thought, not just about us, there is a lot of thought about others. Um, there is a lot of question where you could see it in last week uh, by what people um, shared from the deep heart and so <laughs> we will start Leola do you think that there is something else to say you pretty much uh, covered everything just the activities uh, that might be of interest to English speakers Uh, we read the Golden Light Sutra with the uh, Annie Lossang daily. It's 10 a.m. Israel time. And um, the Green Sutra every day at 
8 p.m. Israeli time. Um, and generally speaking, we meet a lot uh, the Sangha of DFI on Zoom uh, on daily basis, practice together, talk, pray, practice, because uh, we need it. And mm -hmm. uh, we thank Yeshima very much for this teaching on Bodhicitta, but the, uh, the topic of the teaching Yeshima spoke uh, last week. So no need mm -hmm. to repeat. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Dalit, and thank you, Leora. Okay, so, well, I want to apologize, actually. Something I wasn't aware of that last time I went on for too long, and I didn't realize that the programs that follow um, had to be postponed. So now I know, and I'll make a point. I'll, I'll try my best to uh, to be on time. And if I, if I fail to do so, please remind me, Dalit. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, let's take a deep breath. Breathing out, any worry, any fear, just goes. And then just gently place your attention on your breathing, starting just some mindfulness of the breath. Visualize in the space in front of you all the most wonderful qualities such as unconditional love, great compassion, profound wisdom, Manifesting in the form of Buddha Shakyamuni. Embodying all other awakened beings. As well as our spiritual masters. like His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, His Holiness, the Kamapa, and so forth. Wearing the saffron-colored robes of a fully ordained monk, a renunciate, Being a refuge in the sense of teaching us the Dharma.
and inspiring us to become just like him. And then think that you're so surrounded by all sentient beings, all living beings, they're all around you. with all their fears, their worries, their pain, mental or physical. Or both. despite their deep instinctive wish just to be happy and not to suffer. Try to get a sense, try to develop a sense of closeness based on the fact that that which we have in common with all sentient beings outweighs our differences. Try to generate a sense of acceptance and closeness. Connecting with sentient beings at the level of their heart. That's much deeper than their afflictions. And let's take a moment to specifically focus on all their unwanted experiences. On their pain. Their fear. sadness and also their afflictions and let's generate what's called great compassion focusing on all sentient beings and sincerely wishing them to be free from all unwanted experiences, all sufferings and their causes. And wishing that may I be able to help them in whichever way possible to overcome their shortcomings that give rights to so much suffering. We 
may I be able to help them to overcome these obstructions so that they can actualize their fullest potential. And allow that wish, that aspiration to gradually grow stronger. To transform into the altruistic attitude. It's just a type of inner strength that is determined to do whatever we can to assist sentient beings in overcoming their obstructions and in actualizing their fullest potential. And since that is realistically only possible once we become awakened, once we attain the same, same state as the Buddha, let's generate the mind that aspires towards the awakened state of a Buddha, the enlightenment of a Buddha on the basis of our love and compassion for all sentient beings. So while visualizing the Buddha in front of us and holding on to our mind of enlightenment, bodhicitta, let's recite the refuge and bodhicitta prayer. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity, and so forth, May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Okay, so before I start to talk about the Lamrim, I like to say one or two things about some of the questions you asked, which I really uh, appreciated. It got me a, it gave me a, a better sense of how you feel. I mean, also what the lead just says, just, yeah, definitely helps me to understand better, which of course is just an intellectual understanding. No way. Uh, I fully grasp it. That's why I also attended uh, Sergeant Sanchez Rinpoche's teachings before. I wanted to hear more. And yeah, any any comment from you is very helpful. But I was thinking one person, I forget the name now, uh, I think it starts with an E, Ask me about feeling so desperate about the situation, like things are bad and then they just go from bad to worse and then even worse. And my response was, well, to remember the nature of our existence, to remember the nature of samsara. But then thinking about it later on, I thought that can be misconstrued. I mean, I'm not saying let's just give up. 
you know, life sucks and then you die kind of idea. That's not what I meant. Um, it was more like, it reminded me of myself. I mean, I'm in no way in the same situation that the person who asked the question or any of you is. But I have my own moments when I think, oh, you know, now this person is again president. Oh, no. And in that country, it's this right wing person. Oh, and they just cut up all this forest. Oh, no. And like all these bad news and just one after the other. And I'm thinking, oh, gosh, it only goes from bad to worse. And so I'm really seeking some good news. And I have to remind myself, oh, oh of course, I'm in some sorrow. What am I expecting? Right. So it just helps me in that moment not to have these unrealistic expectations. And of course, it's not, it's all doom and gloom. It's not at all. And what I also want to stress is one of the very famous, very uh, helpful quotes by uh, Shantideva, uh, the Bodhisattva's way of life or the way of the Bodhisattva. And a lot of Tibetans live according to this verse. I mean, after spending quite some time with Tibetans, they really live according to these lines. Wait, these are just my notes, but I also prepared some. If there is a remedy, then what is the use of frustration? Oh, you can't see me, right? You can't see this. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, I'm going to read it again. Here. So if there's a remedy, what is the point of frustration? If there is no remedy, remedy, what's the point of frustration? So in other words, of course, to try and find a solution. Is this something I can do? And if there is, why feel disheartened and so forth? If there isn't, why feel disheartened and so forth? Because in the end, it doesn't solve the problem. We'll just feel down. And on top of all the trouble there is already, we feel depressed, etc. Now, that's not easy to live according to these two lines. But if you internalize them and again and again, you remember them when things go badly and when there's problems, it kind of helps this kind of letting go, can't change it. I live with it. This is the nature of samsara for now. But of course, things change, right? So that's what I wanted to stress again, just to be sure it's not misunderstood. Someone asked this brilliant question about not misunderstanding, self-cherishing versus looking after ourselves. I really like this question and I want to address this, but not right now. Anyway, that's just the point I wanted to make. And please, more questions, if more questions or more comments, just to help me better understand what you're going through. I really appreciate that. Okay. Anyway, I uh, will make time for that. I'll be a little bit more on top of um, the time. So uh, let's start with the Lum Room. Okay, so I think I can, can I start sharing the screen? Oh, yeah, yeah. It works. Okay, great. So, yeah, here we are. Um, number of outlines, yes. All right. So, we've gone through these points previously. There wasn't that much um, to say about it because I wanted to right away jump into the actual uh, topic. So, all that it says here is the meditation on equanimity doesn't say much more, which is why I prepared my own notes as part of the Lum Room, because this equanimity is so important. Where are the notes here? Okay. So I just put a few things together. Equanimity. It's this mental equilibrium, because in order to generate love and compassion, this, these mental factors that we talk about, that we go through as part of setting the motivation, uh, which is really like, in my case at least, it's a bit like, well, fake it until you make it, right? Just going through over and over again, just to change the neurons in my brain and 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 leave some imprints in my mind. But just that, that constant repetition makes a huge difference. It's just how our mind works. It works through repeating, through constantly training ourselves. Um, so I'm still at the faking stage, but it's getting a little easier, the faking. <laughs> so um, hopefully moving closer towards making it. But before all these states of mind, 
that are so beautiful, that are so inspirational. I mean, someone also mentioned this last time. I really like this comment by uh, a person saying, when you read these biographies, this is something Tibetans really like to do. I mean, they have books and books and books on the great beings of the past. And they're so inspirational because it's like the theory comes into life through this person. Now, even if we don't meet these people, we can imagine them. These, these books are written in such a way you can really visualize this person and be inspired, be inspired by their love and their compassion. And of course, we have the fortune there, these other masters who are all around us. So even though we may not be able to rub shoulders with them because, well, usually they're quite busy being great masters, um, we still can get a sense of their, their whole being and, and feel inspired. So that is so helpful to allow ourselves to be inspired. There are such important states of mind. I've said this on many occasions. Buddhism the way I see it after having spent some time learning about it, etc., um, is basically a system of psychology. It's a, it's a science of the mind. It's learning about the mind, understanding the mind, and then generating states of mind that deeply benefit us. So devotion and, and being inspired, it's only for our own sake. The Buddhas don't care. It's not for their sake. They don't need anyone to bow to them or make them offerings. They're blissful as they are. They don't need anything further. They've tapped into their own resource of pure happiness. So they don't need that. But because of their incredible compassion, they want us to do it because they can see how it benefits us. These states of mind are so beneficial. It's just, it, it generates a sense of joy and peace when you allow yourself to be inspired by these great beings. So I, I really like this comment. So if you do feel low or you feel there's no way I can practice this, etc., maybe just find a biography. And I'm pretty sure there are a lot of biographies that are translated into English. Short stories and allow yourself to be inspired and get a sense, I can do the same. So it does, not only does it give a sense of joy, a sense of peace in the same sense, like, well, if I'm joyful and I feel there's some hope because there are beings who are so amazing, who in the midst of the worst problems ever grew like lotuses, grew like these pure beings, um, inspiring others and doing a lot of good bringing a lot of happiness. So anyway, I think that's something I, I remember from last time, and I want to uh, stress this again, that this is so helpful and so important to read these stories. But here I'd like to also specifically mention equanimity, that mind of mental equilib equilibrium. It just sounds so beautiful. I love that word. I prefer to equanimity, like having that mental, right? Like instead of being pulled to those beings, I can't be without them, hatred towards others. So it's these afflictions in our mind. And here equanimity doesn't mean you become totally, like totally, have total equanimity towards all sentient beings. That is only when you become a Buddha. But a degree of the equanimity. Why? Because our relationships with other people are very much determined by our attachment, our aversion, and our indifference. In other words, and I know from my own mind, when I'm with a group of people, in my mind, I'm judging right away. Like, don't like, don't care. It's terrible. But I have this automatic response, right? And it changes, you know. Someone praises me and tells me how great I am. Like category. If previously was dislike, right? So I think we have a natural tendency, right? It's just something we've done for, well, from a Buddhist point of view, lifetimes to react in that way. But we can choose not to follow that, to remind ourselves, okay, they, I just, I, I, they're in my like categories because it's my self-centered mind that just told me that, that that's, that's a friend, Right? 
On the other hand, of course, if someone criticizes me or what is mine, of course, they go into the other category and the rest, I don't care. They haven't benefited me. They haven't harmed me. So I don't care. Now, having that natural response is one thing, but not following after it, recognizing it for what it is in a gentle way. Of course, I spoke about it last time. If we want to generate more love, more compassion, we need to start with ourselves. Not to become a Dharma practitioner who's so frustrated with themselves. Oh, I'm not a good enough person. I don't have enough bodhicitta. I'm too self-centered. So in the end, we generate a lot of self-hatred because we want to be these great practitioners and we just can't live up to our expectations. And well, then there's a lot of frustration. So to start in a way to just watch our own mind. What is my reaction with other people? Which category am I putting people into? So as I said, it's a natural response. It, it happens pretty instinctively. But to watch it and stop it when it goes overboard, right? Of course, the first step is to watch it gently and then apply the antidotes. But anyway, what, what is equanimity? Equanimity, and here I just put something together based on how I learned it. Equanimity refers to impartiality, to a certain degree, a certain impartiality towards all sentient beings. It's almost like an openness. It's not like I don't care about anyone. It's not like indifference towards all sentient beings, but rather a curiosity. Oh, what is that? person like who are they so it's like an openness towards all sentient beings an openness towards learning about their good qualities which everyone has i mean there's plenty of negative but there's always something good as well so the kind of a curiosity refers to so therefore impartiality towards all sentient beings and serves as a basis for great compassion and bodhicitta but as I'm going through this, one thing I really want to make clear, I, it was also great to have to hear the question, Danny, I think his name was Danny, um, remember from Yaki's reaction. Um, so about the tiger and everything. And of course, that is so important. And Rimshi, of course, gave a perfect answer, but just something, some thoughts I, I've also had about this, that in the West, we misunderstand especially in the beginning, we misunderstand Buddhism very easily that we think compassion, like a gentleness, it's kind of compassion and loving kindness and so forth, it's external. It's external. So we forget that it's actually a state of mind. It is only a state of mind. It's just, a, it's not like there's there's compassion, which is an act, like a, an action of the body of the speech. No, there's compassionate action, but that's not compassion. It's just driven by that state of mind. But that doesn't mean compassion in the in the in the strictest sense of the word doesn't mean you become a, an idiot like a friar. What's the Hebrew word, right? Friar, like a sucker, uh, like oh come on, beat me up, you know, do it. I'm just such a low person, offer the victory to you and take on, <laughs> no, 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 no. You're not doing the other person a favor in any way. Just on the, just from the point of view of compassion. I think the best examples are parents. Parents love their children, in general, love their children unconditionally. So you do want to be a parent like, come on, be nasty, steal and kill if you like to. Just go ahead. I'm so compassionate, right? No. In our heart, of course, we have love and compassion as a, as a mother, as a father. Well, I say we. I have no idea what that feels like. But as parents, having love and compassion for their child, but externally, it may be very different. There may be very stern actions to to stop that person from harming themselves. As Rinpoche said previously, usually in Buddhism, you talk about four types of actions. There's peaceful, and it's all based on compassion and love. There's a peaceful action, peaceful action. There's, I think Yaki called it magnetizing or increasing or far-reaching uh, kind of actions. 
there are powerful actions and there are wrathful actions. And all based on love. So powerful actions. Many lamas are like that. A lot of people think His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the way he often he often manifests, it's like this kind, I'm not saying this out of lack of respect, but like a cuddly bear, right? Just always so gentle and just, and he is, I mean, internally, mentally, no question. But I've seen his holiness, like powerful, very powerful. Yeah, what's next? What's next? It's like, whoa, not not wrathful, but very powerful. So very peaceful, of course, and those moments, this gentleness. Then what is next? Um, of far-reaching, far-reaching, reaching this person, that person, very extensive actions, saying things that affect people in this very extensive way. So very far-reaching actions. And then there's powerful actions, full of divine pride, like pride in the sense of like a deep self-confidence, very strong, no matter what. Things go wrong, well, you pick yourself up, keep trying. Isn't there a song like that? Keep yourself up. It's a really nice song. I like those words. Pick yourself up and keep trying. Pick yourself up and keep trying, right? So basically, when things go terribly wrong, no, it stays very strong and determined. The more the more problems, the better. So for a practitioner, it's almost like, Wow, these are opportunities to train my mind to to find out which weaknesses, what are my weaknesses, what is it I still have to to pay attention to. And then there's wrathful, of course, as well. If someone behaves in a way that harms this person and others, you become wrathful. Like a parent who punishes his or her child. So anyway. Based on that, I think it's really important to remember it's a state of mind. Kindness, love, compassion, these are all states of mind. And they're always conjoined with wisdom. Very important. So for us in the West, sometimes compassion seems to be a weak mind. You can become like a punching bag, a doormat. Everyone walks over you. Well, only if it's beneficial for others not if it harms them. So, of course, there can be lamas. Okay, you know, there, there are stories of lamas like Atisha surrounding himself with people who are really difficult, who are really obnoxious. Because Atisha saw this as an opportunity to practice patience, to practice generosity, uh, to, well, watch his own mind. I mean, at least manifesting in that way as an ordinary person. Um as someone who who needed to watch their own self-centeredness and so forth. So, therefore, therefore, love and compassion being just mental states doesn't mean externally you cannot be wrathful. Now, I don't want to talk about, I don't want to talk much about the situation right now in Israel, I don't understand it fully. But wrathful actions are important. Are important. I still believe they're important if they're driven by love and compassion. For so many reasons. So I'm a little bit nervous talking about this. But I believe Israeli society, Israeli traditions and customs are very precious and very rich and they need to be preserved. I think it was Ronnie who sent me a video the other day. Was it her? Yes, I think it was. About some British guy who talked about all of these Jewish friends he had, of all the different traditions, and how rich these traditions are, and how important it is to preserve them for so many other people, even if they're not Jewish. He said he, he greatly benefited from them. And I personally feel Israelis are so important for the Dharma because understanding the Dharma very easily and being very creative in their way in which they practice it, etc. So for me, Israel is extremely important and therefore it's very important to show wrathful actions driven by love and compassion when it's necessary. That's all I want to say about this. But 
I think it is really important to understand that love and compassion are states of mind. And Rinpoche said it beautifully. I, I don't really have anything to add to that. Sorry, I did add something, but Rinpoche had already said everything. Anyway, but for that, for for in order to develop these types of mind, equanimity is important. So a sense of impartiality, first of all, which serves as a basis for great compassion and bodhicitta. It constitutes a state of mind that feels it is pointless to generate prejudice towards others. So, okay, initially it's a, a, a natural response, but to come to a point I recognize, oh, I'm just judging right away. But it's pointless to generate prejudice, to discriminate between this is friend, this is a friend, this is an enemy, this person is agreeable and disagreeable, and, and to act under the sway of attachment and anger. Therefore, practitioners who have developed this type of equanimity, they reduce, not eliminate, but reduce the coarser forms of those undesirable responses. And once free from acting under their influence, gain some mental equilibrium. Okay. So hopefully that gives you a sense. I'll make this material available. Um, I haven't had time to do it, but I just finished the preparation for the long life puja so i hope i have more time i think i have more time definitely so i make this available as just some some summary but how do we get there it all sounds great being more having more equanimity more mental equilibrium but how do we get there well there are certain ways there are certain thoughts we can go through that are described in the texts. In order to cultivate such an equanimity, such a state of mind, we should contemplate the following points, which are based on two reasons for why having equanimity towards all sentient beings makes sense. It makes sense. Not having equilibrium doesn't make sense. It makes sense, well, let's put it that way. If you want to suffer, you want to have problems, if we want to really be upset and so forth, let's not practice equilibrium, right? But based on what we want, based on the fact that we want to feel happy and peaceful, be free from afflictions, be free from suffering, then equilibrium is a must. But there are means, of course, to generate uh, such states of mind. And there are these two methods, methods I'm going to talk about now. So first of all, something to to reflect upon is the fact that sentient beings are equal from their side. Now, please don't think of emptiness in this context. I mean, even in Tibetan, some of the words that in the context of emptiness seem to talk about the object of negation are in other contexts uh, used as having a slightly different meaning. So from the point of view of sentient beings, in other words. So from the point of view of sentient beings, sentient beings are equal. It makes sense to have equanimity, in other words. And there's no reason to discriminate from the point of view of our own, from our own perspective. There's no, there's no reason to discriminate. Okay, so let's look at the first point. Sentient beings are equal from their side. So I just put together a few reasons. Their order, it's not in terms of importance, it's just in terms of how I thought of them. All sentient beings are in, in equal in that they want to be happy and do not want to experience suffering. Now, we really need to get a deep feeling for the truth of that statement. It's not, intel it's not enough to just intellectually go, yeah, they all want to be happy and don't want to suffer. But really, try and put yourself into another person's, another being's shoes and get a sense of how this being tries everything to avoid problems, something they don't want. They may, of course, accept short-term suffering for long-term happiness or whatever. Uh, but in general, but in general, so even the masochist would possibly, you know, do things to themselves because it gives them some long-term re relief. Or going to the dentist is another example, right? You go to the dentist. So, okay, you know, there's going to be some pain, but hopefully long-term uh, long -term well-being in terms of your teeth, at least. So the point is, therefore, to really 
develop a sense that whoever there is, in the end, they want to be happy and don't want to suffer. And we, we know we have that in common with them. We always see commonalities with others, right? Something we have in common with them and therefore we feel closer to them. Tibetans have that when someone comes from the same area, Tibet, right? Um, but if we seek, and of course, Israelis have it as well, if they come from the same communities, etc. Um, but in this case, it goes deeper than that. It goes deeper than that. Something we're born with. It's not just the communities we, we grew up in and so forth that we adopted, their customs we adopted. No, something that from the time we were born and even in previous lives, has always been with us. So something we have in common with everyone. And the next part is they were once very close to us. Now, that's a little difficult. Unless you have a sense of past lives, it's a little hard to grasp. But, you know, it's always good to challenge your brain with these ideas, right? I mean, they talk about brain teasers and brain training and so forth. If you just look at you look at it this way and just, you know, just go through the possibilities that you've actually lived before. And what does that entail? Because there's definitely a chance and it definitely makes a lot of sense. Now, I don't have the time to go through all the reasons, but if you, if you are interested and you take some time, it makes perfectly sense we've existed before and then everyone has at some point been very close to us everyone has been your child. They talk about mothers, but nowadays people don't have as much love as for their mothers, I guess, as in the past. But I don't think anything has changed in terms of the love that people have for their, for their children. Right? That's something I observe in the West. Love for their parents, not the same as before. Love for children doesn't seem to have changed. So just think, Everyone has been your child at some point. You love this other person and you would have done anything for them. Right? It's kind of like, wait a minute. That person, yes, but not him or her. <laughs> so just to, to give it a try. Yeah, but maybe also him or her. Different in a different form, in a different existence, but same mental continuum. Right? So in my case, of course, there's certain ideas I'm resistant to towards like I, I feel some resistance and that's when I especially do them I'm like I'm curious why do I feel so resistant so I'm playing around with that a little bit why do I feel especially resistant with regard to this person spiders <laughs> in my case I'm not um not I'm not a great fan to say the least of spiders so that spider has been my child okay stay over there <laughs> but this <laughs> Right. So anyway, um, so these are all ideas that may be helpful. Number one, sentient beings have been very close to us. Sorry, number one, they all want to be happy and have once been very close to us. Number two, they've been very close to us. Number three, they all have a mind that from the point of view of its deeper nature, of its uh, ability to know things, its ability for things to appear to it are not affected by afflictions. Especially this very subtle mind, the very subtle mind that arises for at the time when we fall asleep, when we, well, um, it's, it's, it's not exactly the same mind, but it comes very close to that very subtle mind that we all possess that is totally unaffected by any negativity. And especially when we die, it manifests then. So this mind, this precious mind, everyone has it, but we can't control it right now. We have no way to allow for it to arise. Now, many of what I'm saying, you already know, but it's so important to internalize, to know it, not just with your brain, but with your heart. That's a very Western way of talking, but on a deeper level, on a deeper level, more on an emotional level, like, wow, yes, everyone has that type of mind. And because they have this type of mind, they all have Buddha nature. Everyone has the potential to become a Buddha. And of course, from an ultimate point of view, they lack inherent existence. So we don't need to go into that right now. But um, that's not the topic we're, we're 
right now talking about. But the first four points, to really spend some time on them, to not just read them and go, yeah, yeah, right, what's next? No, to spend some time on them, to really go over it. And again, it doesn't have to be in an uncomfortable cross leg position. It can be anywhere to bring this home that actually all sentient beings have these definitely first four qualities. Okay. And you can leave out whichever ones you feel comfortable with. But maybe if you feel some resistance, take a deeper look why that is. And then there's no reason to discriminate from our perspective, from our side. So this was from the point of view of sentient beings and then from our own perspective. First of all, regarding our relationship with other sentient beings, we are attached to some, have aversion towards others, and feel indifference to, indifferent towards the rest. That summarizes all our relationships, right? Of course, there's certain degrees in terms of our attachment, from some attached to some, more attached to some, less attached to others, and so forth. There's more anger and, and so forth, and indifference. Well, the rest we don't really care about. However, there are numerous disadvantages. We need to become aware of how these states of mind harm us. It's not sentient beings. In the end, it's the state of mind, much more so. And again, allow for some time. Attachment, how does it harm us? How does this wish to control another person, the other situation? Can't be without them, right? The stronger it is, the more we suffocate ourselves, suffocate others, and we want to control the other person. And as a response to that, they move away. So it has the opposite effect of what we actually want. The more attached we are and the more that attachment expresses itself in our actions, the more the person moves away, right? Then there's aversion. The stronger our aversion, the more it harms us on a physical level, mental level. I mean, there have been so many, there's been so much research on exactly the harmful um, effects of aversion and so forth. So it doesn't harm the other person. We may think so, but it doesn't. It harms us. And of course, indifference as well. This kind of like, oh, I don't care. I don't care. But actually, to generate pure happiness, we need other sentient beings. We're all connected with the rest of the universe, and that means with the rest of all other sentient beings. So if we're connected to all of them and ignore them at the same time, that is totally ludicrous. Totally ludicrous. It doesn't make sense because we can't, we don't exist in a bubble. We exist in connection with everyone else. And therefore, their well-being is essential for our own well-being. So to be indifferent, we just harm ourselves. We're basically indifferent to our own happiness. So therefore, to reflect on these disadvantages of having attachment, aversion, and so forth, which lead to us not having equanimity in the way I described. And our preference or dislike for the some sentient beings is often based on very superficial reasons. Very superficial. And many of those reasons, if not all, are not in accordance with reality. Think of any situation. I just like them because they, they looked at me in a funny way or whatever, right? I mean, I'm not talking about deeper aspects here, like what is going on in Israel right now. I'm just talking about day-to-day -day kind of situation because it's possibly too early and too painful to go into these aspects. But just think of ordinary daily life that despite the difficulties, of course, there's still some ordinary day li daily life and they have what pisses us off. I mean, sometimes very superficial reasons and sometimes we don't really know what is going on. We just assume and oftentimes don't get it right. Yeah, I've had my own share of meeting someone and thinking, oh, that person sucks. They're probably like this, that, and the other. And when I got to know them, I found, oh, no, I couldn't be, I couldn't be more wrong. I couldn't be more wrong. Anyway, okay. And then regarding uh, the, the, the last, the next point is regarding sentient beings that really benefited or harmed us in this life, our relationships with those beings are not as clear-cut and unchangeable as they seem. Again, try to discover within your own mind, and this is a very interesting 
a very curious kind of aspect of our own mind, how our mind continuously holds on to permanence. I discover it in myself time and again. I'm thinking like, oh, yeah, I understand impermanence. Yeah, maybe in a certain moment when some clever person explains it to me. But a moment later, the sense of, oh, it's permanent, holding on to it. I catch myself all the time, these little, little moments, or not little, sometimes huge moments of mind suggesting that things are going to be the same. Oh, this will always be my friend. This will always be someone I don't like. Not at all. It keeps constantly changing. So to remind ourselves, Leora mentioned it last time, impermanence, so important. And not just within this lifetime, there can be many changes. I mean, all we know, it can all be different in a week or in a month. Anything can happen. The ever-changing relationship we have with sentient beings are even more apparent when considering past and future lives. Okay. So here's something to reflect on. I think it's so important to spend more time with equilibrium, with this equanimity. And as I said, it's not generating an impartiality that is a kind of indifference, but rather it's an openness towards anyone. An openness, like a, it's almost like you open your heart. Not almost, it's really you open your heart to all sentient beings, going beyond these superficial ideas, but understanding that underneath, on a deeper level, these four points or even five points that I made earlier, well, they apply to all sentient beings. Yeah, they are. All right. As always, I think I'm going to cover so much and then I end up not covering that much. But anyway, we've covered equanimity. We've gone through equanimity today. Uh, there's still time to do the meditation and I want to do a meditation on exactly this. Now I want to hear from you. So like last time, trust me, it helped me so much. It really, really helped me. So please know that and don't feel shy. They're very good. There's the first person. All right, please. Oh, it was you last time. It was Orit who talked about the lamas, right? Yes, I remember now. Oh, yes. Please, Orit, go ahead. Orit, you're muted. Ah, please unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah, because it's helped me when I did a lot of meditation, not a lot, but some meditation on compassion, and I felt exhausted uh, with the sadness so watching the movie I, I read a little bit but watching uh, I mean uh, the 16 Karmapa or Dale Cookins or Impuche and mm. so that helped but I had another thought this morning I'm sorry that it's not related to equanimity um, that I can bring my mind to enlightenment but it's just one mind it, mm -hmm. it felt like it's not enough. You know, there's so mm -hmm. much suffering, but it's just one mind. And mm. I, and I, like on my way to work, I try to think if there are like I know that every Buddha makes uh, vows on his part as a Bodhisattva, but but do they make like combined vows like? I don't know, five bodhisattvas that said that this time or at that place we'll do this or that. Like I thought about the TV series from when I was a child, the Transformer, that they had each car had its own ability, but when they got together, then they had extra. Oh. Mm, interesting idea. Kind of like these five bodhisattva friends kind of getting together and making... Like and then they, it's like, I don't know, but um, right? Not just five. Let's take like a whole, I don't know, group of like 10, 15. I mean, it's a beautiful idea and who knows why not? I mean, I haven't come across this. But in the end, if we think about it, bodhisattvas who are on the path, I mean, developing their mind does not just mean that they develop deeper love deeper compassion and so forth but also other mental abilities that we all i mean we all have the potential to generate but it takes some work it takes some work especially 
uh, first generating equanimity, love, compassion, and so forth, where they have the ability to communicate with each other, not via Zoom, <laughs> but in other ways, I mean, mentally. And I'm pretty sure that many of the great masters, they communicate with each other in different ways. And who knows, they're like, I think they're all, they're, they're, they're getting together with all the bodhisattvas, basically. They're all like a huge club, right? So it's like, how can I assist this bodhisattva and that bodhisattva? So, of course, as one person, well, there's this really famous saying, I'm only one person, but I'm one person. There's one author, one famous uh, American Ed Edward Haley or something. Anyway, an, an author and, and historian. I really like that saying. I'm only one person. So I can't do everything, but I'm one person. There's a lot I can do. So in that sense, yeah, I'm only one person. So I need other bodhisattvas. And I'm pretty sure that you seek the support of others because, well, two is always better than one. But because I only have one mind or one mental continuum, still I can do so much. So I'll do whatever I can, but I don't do it on my own. I get together with others. So, yeah, definitely. I think they don't need to probably make like a, find like some kind of club or something. I think it's just a natural thing, right? It's just a natural thing. So communicating with other bodhisattvas in a mental way or, of course, also in a physical way when they meet, and they support each other. I mean, to just give you an example from the point of view of what we can perceive, the great lamas, they support each other. Sometimes there's there seems to be a dispute between this lama from this, from this um, tradition and the lama from that tradition. But when you look closer, it's the people, you know, following them, helping them, etc., who are sometimes just very ordinary. And they have they don't get along with the other's assistant or something. And it seems like there's a, an actual dispute between the two, two lamas, but there isn't. They're very much in tune. They're very much uh, support each other. So I think they're actually, it's the we for them. It's not the I. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Arit, for that. Yeah. Okay. Shmuel. 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 Yes, please. Aren't you the, didn't you ask me the question about the difference between self-centeredness and is that you? Yeah, that was a good question. I haven't addressed it yet, but I want to, but please go ahead, Preston. I wanted to ask about equanimity. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that equanimity is not indifference and it is important to understand this. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I look uh, technically at the definition of equanimity that you have provided mm -hmm. us, then yes. I can fit indifference exactly to that definition mm -hmm. just uh, fits so. very good very good and that's why i love teaching israelis okay very good you are right to the point that's true just from the definition you see tibetans in the tibetan text emotional states are very difficult to, to define very difficult so they don't spend that much time on putting down definitions, it's rather like explaining it so people understand the definition. But you're absolutely right. Just from reading it, it seems it gives rise to indifference. Um, so I didn't want to add anything into the explanation that I didn't find in the text, at least the text that I studied. So they keep it short, sweet and short. But then, of course, it needs to be explained, as I said what is beyond the words, and it doesn't contradict this. It actually doesn't contradict that because if you have this openness, if you open your heart towards all sentient beings, a sense of curiosity, right? Still, you would not act out of uh, attachment or would not allow yourself to be swayed by extreme attachment and extreme anger, etc. right? So if you understand that, then it's almost like you move towards sentient beings, Right? Not like, so it's like to make it practical. How does this make, how would you do this in a practical situation? Ordinarily, I'm with other people and I have this like, dislike, don't care, like, dislike, don't care. You go here, you go right in my mind. So I want to sit with those people I like, far away from the ones I don't like. And the rest, you can sit near me, I don't care. Okay. So in like a social situation, but I'll seek out the ones I don't like. Let's get to know them. 
Let's spend some time with them. And I'm just saying social setting. I'm not saying in any kind of extreme situation. No, social setting that we all know. Let me go against my own instinct, right? And allow myself to be open. And before you know, you probably have a new friend, right? So that's what's meant. But I'm glad you you, you address this. Thank you for doing so. It's the time, yeah. Okay, great. Who's next? No one? Well, maybe I address Shmuel's. Am I saying it right? Shmuel? Yeah. Yeah, I thought about this the whole week. This is so great about this because I've although I have to do work, but I have time to reflect on things. And everything that you said, it stayed with me and it came over and over. And I was thinking, a lot of Buddhism is about finding a middle way, about exactly hitting what is it on one hand, one extreme. So, well, let me start with this. As part of, as being a living being, as being a sentient being, our main problem is that we, I, I, I mean, I can say we have afflictions, etc. but let's term it differently. Our main problem is we fall constantly into extremes. All the time we fall into extremes. So every afflictive emotion is an extreme. And starting with the root misperception that we all have, that's an extreme mind. It perceives things in a totally extreme way. It adds too much to the way in which phenomena really exist. And therefore, it leads to extreme states of mind such as attachment, aversion, etc. They're all extreme. And so now, Buddhist practice is very much a training in trying to find the middle that is free from the extremes. And because we are so going into extremes all the time, that is difficult in the beginning. This is not just with regard to emptiness, but it's also with regard to what is the difference between neglecting myself and being self-cherishing, right? Those are the two extremes. I totally neglect, neglect myself. Is that a good idea? No. You harm yourself and you harm others, right? If you neglect yourself, which means you don't eat properly, you don't feed yourself, that's like a mother who has 10 children and stops eating and sleeping. She doesn't do her children any favor because it's probably going to kill her and they'll be orphaned. In the same way, between so one, on one hand, neglecting ourselves to not looking after ourselves no, this is a very precious person. You yourself, very precious. You're only one, but you are one. You're only one person, but you're one person. You're important. Therefore, you count. It's important you look after yourself, not just for your own benefit, but for the benefit of other sentient beings. Versus now, having found that, okay, so I'm looking after myself, but now... I'm just so only into myself. So my well-being has become now more important than others. So if previously it was like, I don't count. I'm out. I'm out. Only other sentient beings count. Big problem. For your own benefit and for the benefit of others. And then the other extreme is, I'm more important. You see, two extremes. We have to find the middle. But now... What seems contradictory when saying that? They talk all the time about other sentient beings are more important than me. So what is this? All the time, like others outweigh me. Put yourself, put others before yourself, etc. That seems contradictory. No, no, no. Actually, it isn't. It's just a method. When you're a gymnast and you're on a, on a balancing beam, Right? If you fall too far to one side, equilibrium, which would be like the position that you have when you're in the middle, doesn't help you. You have to extreme, you have to go to the other side to really make an effort to go back into balance. So since beginningless time, it's been I, me, and mine. My well-being over that, over that of others. My so in in all my actions, 
in all my actions, it's somehow there's this pull towards my benefit, right? Even when I practice the Dharma, oh, I was so generous. I hope everyone knows, right? Oh, I'm so compassionate. Did you see me? Right? So even in the Dharma, we just bring it with us. We just bring it with us. So to 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 go to the other extreme, it's helpful for our mind, not realistic necessarily. In the back of our mind, we should know it's not realistic. It's a method. It's a method. So if I make my mind think other sentient beings are more important, I can get used, I can get, get back my balance. That's why it's said. Yeah. But actually, we're all equally important. It wouldn't make any sense otherwise. Right? Okay. Great. So I hope I addressed this. Um, or I answered it. Yeah. Great. Any more questions before we start the meditation? Today, I, I'm safe. I'm trying to be safe to finish on time. Or anything about the situation? I mean, if the, if anyone likes to help me with this, yeah, Orit, go ahead. Yeah, I have another comment. Uh, well, Please. when I did meditation on equanimity, I thought that they are all equal in the way that they can't uh, like affect my either marriage or they can't purify for me or they can't create marriage for me. I mean, I'm the only one that can do this or mm. that. Very uh, nice. Very nice. Oh, very nice. Very good point. I have to add that to my notes. They're all equal that they can't bring me lasting happiness. In the end, that's my own pro my own responsibility. So no one can truly harm me, right? No one can truly harm me. No one can truly benefit me. Absolutely. I'm my worst enemy and I'm my, my best friend. I can be my best friend and I can be my worst enemy. So... We're scared of others. We should really be more scared of our own afflictions. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can. So really in this situation, um, what I would like you to do, all of you, just to take one book right now in this situation, and that is the Bodhisattva way of life. I mean, every day I, I make it like a, a duty, if you like, during these really difficult times you're going through, make it a point every day, read a few verses. They're beautiful translations. I followed now the Patma, Patmakara, I think they're called, that translation. Um, please, it's so helpful. Just preparing some of the verses. I was like, ah, oh. five, ten minutes I sat with these verses to just write them in my notes. I haven't had time to go through them today. And I was like, oh, my God, this text is such a jewel. It helps in so many situations. So please, what you mentioned, Dalit, you made this point about so much fear of what's going to happen and everything. Um, I believe this book, and not every verse will help you, but just read through it and see whether you find a solution to what's just going on with your life right now. And I think uh, Venerable Lopsang taught on this text. So I'm sure there are recordings uh, making it easier to understand with her commentary. All right. Okay. Uh, Yaki is teaching it at the moment every Friday. Perfect. Ah, oh, this is so important. Very good. Yes. So there you go. Uh, please follow his teachings um, if you have the time so you get more explanations, but also make it a point to read through it and spend some time reflecting on it. It's it's such an important text. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now let's do a meditation on equanimity. Yeah. Spend a little bit more time on breathing just to calm the mind. Stay in the present. Again, a very helpful tool when things are crazy around us. Just be mindful of the breath. So let's do that together. And then I do a guided meditation.
So take a moment to apply a type of self-reflection. Remembering past events, past situations. When our mind divided other people into those we like, those who we dislike, and everyone else we're indifferent to what. Does that sound familiar? And are there times when even though we're aware of the sentiment that that way of discriminating between people. So we don't only really do anything about it, but allow ourselves to be partial. Depriving ourselves of the opportunity to get to know some beautiful people. And then let's reflect on the fact that that kind of partiality doesn't make sense from the point of view of other people, nor from the point of view of ourselves. So let's reflect on the fact that from the point of view of others, there's a lot more we have in common with them or that which we have in common with them outweighs that which distinguishes us from them. Most importantly, we're all the same and not wanting to experience mental or physical pain and instead feel satisfied and happy. Spend a moment on that, just thinking all sentient beings, whoever they are, have that deep instinctive 
Wesh. It's not something that is acquired, but something we are born with. Something that informs, that influences all our actions. Likewise, all sentient beings have a mind that despite their anger, their hatred, their greed, attachment, stinginess, arrogance, ignorance, and so forth, It's actually on the deepest level not affected by any of these afflictions. They're merely temporary and adventitious. And never, ever affect the deepest clear light mind that everyone has. That subtle mind. That although it manifests rarely, we can never lose it. And it's that mind that will eventually transform into the awakened mind of a Buddha. Which is why all sentient beings have the potential to become a Buddha. Also, if there is reincarnation, If we've lived before, if we've lived or existed since beginning this time, then everyone has at some point been very close to us. We've had any relationship that is possible. And so everyone has once been our son or daughter. Who we have would have willingly given our life for. Who we loved possibly more and ourselves.
So having considered the fact that from the perspective of others, discriminating and being partial doesn't make sense. Let's look at it from our own perspective. The minds that drive our partiality, such as attachment, and aversion, and indifference, just harm ourselves. They are the enemy, the enemies. They can rob us of our well-being for many, many lifetimes to come. And our preference or dislike for others is usually based on very superficial reasons, if not totally wrong reasons. Due to our impermanence, none of the relationships we have right now will last forever. None of them. So having briefly reflected on these different reasonings, check whether you are able to open your heart with a sense of curiosity towards all sentient beings. taking a step towards them. In preparation for generating love and compassion. So just focus on that sense of opening your heart, taking a step towards sentient beings in an impartial manner. And then, of course, very important, let's dedicate whatever virtue we've accumulated through our practice today, through our meditation and so forth. May this become a cause for us, of course, in the future to become fully awakened, to utilize our subtle mind, 
uh, subtle clear light might not just for our own welfare but for the welfare of each and every sentient being and may our positive potential cause our great lamas our greatly realized masters to have a long and healthy life to continue to inspire us through their words and their actions and lastly May this virtue we accumulated today multiply and have an effect on what's going on, in particular right now in Israel. Bring peace of mind to all those who suffer mentally and physical, wherever they are, whatever community they belong to. And may they find peace and love in their hearts. So with this in mind, let's recite the, the prayers. Through the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings, without exception, into that enlightened state. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chunrezi, Denzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the precious Bodhi mind, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, don't forget... The Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva Chayatara, that is the way of the Bodhisattva to read that. And then I see you again next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you very much.